Good morning, church, and everyone who is joining us on Facebook Live today. We're so glad that you have chosen to um, worship with us through this electronic means. And uh, I would just love for us to be able to connect with you if you are new to our church, uh, if you are watching online and have never been to our church, we would love to connect with you. You can do that by going to our webpage, www.DaytonUnitedMethodistChurch.org. And on the very front page, there's a, a link to a worship resources page. And on that page, there's a connection card button. And if you've touched that, um, then you can fill out a little form and send it to us, and we can connect with you that way. I hope maybe that you will. Um, I would also point you to, on that same worship page, that, that same worship resources page, you'll find the uh, sheets that have the lyrics to the songs on a given Sunday. You'll find our prayer list, and you'll also find a note-taking outline that goes with the message. You can download that, print it out, and then fill it out as the message proceeds. So those are on the worship resources page. Now we have a happy announcement today. The Step Parish Relations Committee and I are happy to announce the hiring of a new youth pastor at Dayton United Methodist Church. Caleb Cornell uh, will, is joining us. He's already here. Um, Caleb and Hannah and Nolan moved into the second parsonage yesterday, and um, he starts this week as our new youth pastor here at Dayton United Methodist Church. Welcome, welcome, Caleb and Hannah. If you'd like to send a, a little greeting card of welcome or anything like that, for now, please send it to the church office because they haven't yet set up the post office box with the local post office uh, that is required living in the town of Dayton. Um, so uh, your, your financial faithfulness has made this possible. Our church is in a really good financial position right now. And so we believed that after searching since November that we could proceed with this hiring. So um, just ask you to pray for Caleb and Hannah and Nolan and uh, for the future of our youth group to be uh, all God wants it to be. Uh, finally, I do still need you ask for it requests. Um, and on that worship resources page, there's a button that says submit your you ask for it request. This can be a topic, a question, or a scripture that you would like to hear a sermon about, a message about. And I'll compile all the requests and make the summer sermon series you ask for it. So I hope maybe that you will uh, look for that. Also, um, because of the governor's announcement on Friday, um, in-person worship will be resuming sometime this month. The administrative council is going to meet by Zoom this Tuesday and work through logistics and work through the starting date. And we will announce more about that, more details about that later in the week this week. Um, uh, it would not be before May 17th, might not be until May 24th. Ad Council will have to make that final decision. Uh, may not be till the 1st of June if in the next two weeks uh, the coronavirus just goes rampant and the governor closes down um, groups of larger than 25 or 10 or, or worship services again. So we're, we're going to err on the side of caution if we err, and um, uh, we'll let you know more about that when the time comes. So let me start with an opening prayer, then we're going to blow the shofar, the ram's horn that calls us to worship and calls the heavenly host to join us. So let's pray together, please. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love. Thank you for this time of worship. I pray that you would unite our minds and hearts together, even across the miles, as we worship in a scattered way. And I pray that you would fill us with your presence and help us, Lord, to be thankful to be worshipful, and to grow deeper as we worship together today. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Well, good morning, church. It's so wonderful to worship with you online today. We are going to sing page 110 in your hymnals, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
All right, church, we're going to turn our attention toward prayer now. We have uh, some prayer requests. Um, you will see that the family of Alex Elijah uh, needs our prayers. That's Jody Powell's dad who passed away last Sunday in South Carolina. And, of course, the family could not travel there for the funeral, so uh, please pray for the whole family. Edna Johnson has asked for prayer. She lost her job uh, through this pandemic, and we want to pray not only for her but for everyone who have lost their jobs um, or been furloughed during uh, the shutdown. And then, uh, of course, protection for the essential workers and wisdom uh, for officials um, in reopening the state, but also wisdom for the Ad Council uh, here at the church as we meet this week to talk about reopening worship in person. Uh, we, we don't want to do that in a way that endangers folks, and we want everybody to be able to make their own choices um, about uh, whether to come or whether to stay but we also uh, want to be wise. So pray for us. Pray for God's guidance. Uh, we'll sing a prayer hymn now. Uh, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me, and then I will lead us in prayer. Page number 393 in your hymn.
And now will you join me in prayer? God, thank you so much that we can open our hearts to the very presence of the Spirit of the living God, the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ alive in us because we have put our trust in him. And you promised whenever we open our hearts to you, you come in. You, Jesus, you said, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and, and dine with him and he with me. You want to be part of our lives, intimately part of our lives. And so you are pleased every time we pray, every time we sing, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me. Fill me, Lord. Use me. So, Father, uh, we open our hearts to your presence and we pray that you will fill us with the love of Jesus, you will fill us with the power of Jesus, you will fill us with the healing of Jesus, that you will fill us with every good thing that your Son gives to his people. God, we pray that you would make our lives a blessing to others because if you do that, we will be blessed. So help us, Lord, to uh, reach out, to encourage, to do acts of kindness, to serve, to bless, to pray for others, and in giving our lives away, we trust you will bless us. Father, we pray for our world, this crazy world, this, this pandemic and the division of our whole society, the political divisions, uh, all of the rest. God, we pray, move in our society, move in our nation, move in our own lives and in our community. Bring us together in love. Help us, Lord, to be peacemakers in the midst of it all. We pray that you would uh, minister to the lives of every person who is affected by the shutdown and the pandemic, by the virus and its effects. Today we would pray for uh, Jody Powell's family on the death of her father, Alex. We ask you, God, to comfort them. Give them your peace. Today we would pray for Edna Johnson and all of the other folks who have been furloughed or lost their jobs because of all of the shutdowns of businesses. We pray, God, as they restart, as they relaunch, that people will get back to work. And we pray, Father, that you would keep them safe from infection as we open society back up and as people go back to work. We pray for all those uh, essential workers and now all the other workers who are going back to work. We ask you to keep them safe so that we can have the supplies we need, the food we need, the health care that we need. And especially, Father, would you protect those first-line workers who are battling the virus. We pray for healing for anyone who has contracted this virus. And God, we pray for comfort for those families who have lost loved ones to the virus. Father, we pray for wisdom in not only reopening our state and reopening uh, business and reopening uh, our society, but Lord, we pray for wisdom in reopening our church for worship in person. Some of us, God, are going to be very reluctant to come back to a public space yet, and that's okay. I pray, God, that you would help us remain sheltered at home and safe. Others of us can't wait to get back together and, and have uh, very little fear that, that uh, we're going to be infected or infect others. And, and God, as we practice social distancing and as we um, make sure that we are not in a high-touch uh, situation, I just pray that, that we can resume worship in person in the right timing so that we can be together in your presence and we can encourage one another as the body of Christ again. May your will be done in all of it. Father, uh, we ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit and your blessing in our lives and through us in all things. May your will be done. And we ask it all in the name and authority of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us when we pray to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And again, just before we go to uh, one more song before the message, I want to thank you for your generosity and faithfulness in giving. And again, um, our church is in a really good financial position right now because you've continued to be faithful, and we thank God for that. Uh, you can give by the give button online at the website or mail checks to the church. And um, again, hopefully in two or three, four weeks, uh, sometime along the way soon, uh, we'll be together. And uh, we can give our offering to the Lord right here in the church building. So now we're going to sing one more song before the message. And that song is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Page 384 in your hymnal. Amen. May the Lord do those very things in us by the power of his Holy Spirit. Now, if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26 this morning. The Apostle Paul says this, and God says it through him. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the spirit desires what is contrary, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit desires what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. 
I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying one another. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. Father, speak to us. Open your word to us. Bless us with the presence of your Holy Spirit. And uh, as we hear your voice, not just the voice of human lips, but as we hear the voice of your Spirit speaking to us, as we respond in faith, work your transformation in our hearts. Make us everything you want us to be. Oh God, make us more like Jesus. We pray it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, if you have that note-taking outline downloaded and printed out, now would be the time to take that out and follow along. The words that go in the blanks on the sheet will be on the screen uh, above my shoulder here uh, throughout the rest of the service. All right, Bubba comes down from the mountains of the Carolinas, and he's carrying a Bible. He's all dressed up, and he's carrying a Bible. His friend says, Bubba, where are you headed? He said, well, I've been hearing about New Orleans. And at New Orleans, I've been hearing how they got a lot of liquor, and how they got a lot of gambling, and how they got a lot of really naughty shows. And his friend said, okay, Bubba, I understand that, but why are you carrying that Bible? And Bubba said, well, if it's as good as they say it is, I just might stay over till Sunday. Yeah, truth is, we have a huge capacity to rationalize our sin and our faith, to to set one aside for the other, to believe that it's okay to sin as long as we have faith. And that breaks the heart of God because the flesh and the spirit are in opposition to each other. This is our third and final week of our Free in Christ series, worship series, in Galatians chapter 5. You remember that first week we looked at for freedom, Christ has set us free. And so we are confined, but free. Uh, No confinement, no quarantine can keep us from being free in Christ. The second week, we looked at, at how we are not to use our freedom as a license for indulgence. And so we are free, but not indulgent. This week, we're looking at how the Holy Spirit can free us from the works of the flesh and grow the fruit of the Spirit in us. And so we are free in the Spirit. Free in the Spirit. So here's the human condition. We have a war going on inside of us between the Spirit and the flesh. All of us have these two parts of our lives, the, the Spirit and the flesh. Even if we've never said yes to Jesus yet, God created us in his image and put souls in us that long for him. And there's something inside of us that knows when the stuff we do in life that's not godly, that that there's something wrong with that. There's this warfare between the spirit and the flesh. And walking by the spirit means, in Galatians 5, 16, walking by the spirit means that we do not gratify the desires of the flesh. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walking by the Spirit is to deny the the flesh. Walking for one means denying the other. Walking in holy things means that we have to put away worldly things. Walking in the Spirit means desiring what God wants for our lives. And we will find very quickly that what God wants for our lives sometimes means we have to let go of the things we enjoy or the things we like that are worldly but aren't really satisfying. 
So uh, one thing to understand about this is that when Paul talks about the flesh, he's not talking about flesh and blood. He's not talking about our physical bodies. The flesh to Paul is our fallen sin nature. It is everything about us that rebels against God and his joy and blessing in our lives. It's our fallen sin nature that Paul refers to when he talks about the flesh. So spirit and flesh are in conflict. Spirit and flesh are in conflict. Verse 17, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. One is contrary to the other. And so we see in our lives that the desire for one is contrary to the desire for the other. Um, take power, for instance, being the top dog, being the CEO of the business, being the the head leader of an organization, uh, being the highest politician that we can possibly get elected to. That desire to be the top dog is contrary to the desire to be humble and to serve others. Now, you can be a servant leader and be the CEO of a company. You can But that desire in us to be the top, to, to be number one, That desire is contrary to the spirit of humility and serving others. And so the works of the flesh are in war, in contradiction to the the, the, the works of the spirit. The desire to accumulate stuff for ourselves is contrary to the desire to bless others. Uh, it It is revealing that in the United States of America, one of the top businesses in the world is storage units. We have so much stuff, we can't even keep all of it in our homes. And uh, so we have storage units that are crammed with all the stuff. wonder what would happen if we believed Dave Rams and we sold all that stuff and used the money to uh, make sure our families are, are ministered to and to bless others. Um, the, the desire to accumulate is contrary to the desire to bless Paul um, shared very vulnerably about this inner warfare that goes in inside of us in Romans chapter 7. In Romans 7, uh, verses 14 through 25, we read this. Romans 7, verses 14 through 25. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. There's the flesh. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Oh, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Does that sound familiar? Do you share Paul's struggle as like I share Paul's struggle? There are so many things in our lives. There's so much in our experience in the past where I knew the good thing to do, but I didn't do it. Or I knew the wrong thing not to do, but I did it anyway. And I still do that. I'm still tempted to it. And I still fall into that from time to time now. After years and years of walking with Jesus, it has not gone away because that flesh, that fallen sin nature won't let go, even though it was defeated when Jesus died on the cross. So 
Paul next, in the next few couple of verses, looks at the acts of the flesh, the acts of the flesh in verses 19 through 21. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That list of the acts of the flesh, the the works of the flesh that Paul shares here is a list of indulgence. It's a list of selfishness. It's a list of of doing what we want to do and we don't care what God says, we don't care what other, we don't care if other people are, are used for us to have those pleasures. We don't care if we disappoint them. We go ahead and do it anyway because of the call of the flesh in our sinful nature. And Paul reminds us at the end, those who live like this and keep on living like this and do not come to the Holy Spirit, come to Jesus and find his releasing power, his freedom to to live by the Holy Spirit, if we don't find that, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. The acts of the flesh. They're detrimental and they're tenacious. Then Paul lists the fruit of the Spirit. The contrast to the acts of the flesh is the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 22 and following. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Where the acts of the flesh is a list of indulgence and selfishness, the the list of the fruit of the Spirit is a description of actions that bless others. When we love, when we're joyful, when we have peace, when we're kind, when we're faithful, when we're gentle, when we practice self-control, we bless others and we honor Christ. It is a description, isn't it, of the character of Jesus. It's to to live with the fruit of the Spirit displayed in our lives is to be Christ-like. Who was more kind than Jesus? Who had more love than Jesus? Who who, Who showed more joy than Jesus? Who was more gentle than Jesus? Who had more self control than Jesus? It's his character living in us. God wants to restore us to our original design. And our original design is this. We were created in his image. We were created to bear his image, to be like the living God. And our fallen sin nature has kept us from that. Our fallen sin nature has has tarnished that inside us. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, by our faith in Jesus Christ, God wants to restore that image-bearing in our lives and make us Christ-like, make us like Jesus. And against such things, there is no law. There is no rule that says you shall not be kind. There is no law that says you shall not have joy. So if this is true, if there's a war going on inside of us, and if the flesh is in opposition to the Holy Spirit working in our lives and the Spirit in our hearts that wants what God wants in our lives, how do we get there? How do we, how do we get out of the works of the flesh? And how do we walk in the Spirit and have the fruit of the Spirit growing in our lives? Verse 24 gives us part of the key. Verse 24 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Something inside of us has to die for us to be everything God wants us to be. Something in that sin nature needs to be crucified, needs to die for us to be like Jesus. And the Holy Spirit rooting out of our lives that worldliness, that, that those things of the flesh, is like a surgeon removing cancer from the body of a person who's going to die if the cancer is not taken out. Listen, Jesus is toxic to the sin nature. When he comes into our lives, the sin nature has to go. The sin nature has to die because the Lord of life is present. And because Jesus knows that stuff kills us. And so he has to remove it from us. 
The reality of being in Christ is uh, like that surgeon removing the cancer. The fruit of the Spirit, if, if that's going to grow in our lives, it's Holy Spirit work. Um, we, we can desire it. We can trust God for it. We can cooperate with the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, but only the Holy Spirit can do this soul transformation inside of us. And so the next verse says this. In verse 25, the Apostle Paul says this. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. How do we get there? We live by the Spirit. We live by the Spirit. We keep in step with the Spirit. We live by the Spirit. We trust Him and not ourselves for this transformation. Here's what I know. If it's all left up to me, I will keep, keep on going on and be just like I've always been. And transformation, very little transformation will come if it's just all up to me. This is not about becoming good people through our own human effort. This is about the transforming work of God's spirit in our lives, changing us in places and at levels that we cannot change ourselves because of the entrapment of the sin nature. We trust him for this transformation. And so we live by the spirit. We live by the work of the Holy Spirit. We trust him to root that sin out of us and grow that fruit into us. And the second half of the verse is that uh, we, we not only live by the Spirit, we keep in step with the Spirit. We welcome his work in our lives. And when the Holy Spirit calls us to a transforming place, when there's a battle going on and the Holy Spirit says, uh, this is the direction I want you to go. This is how you will find godliness. This is how your life will flourish and thrive. And it means sacrificing something out of the worldly flesh. Then we have the decision to walk with the Spirit. We have the decision to uh, keep in step with the Spirit, to go where the Holy Spirit directs us into the center of God's will. You can resist. I'm going to see if I can get, get rid of that. I hear a, a uh, static. All right, I hope, it go, I hope it's gone away now. You can resist or grieve the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. But the moment you do, he is no longer Lord of your life. The moment you say no, the Holy Spirit may keep working and may keep calling you back to, say, to a yes, but the Holy Spirit does not ever force us to decide against our will to follow God, and so we can resist or grieve him. Now, my experience is that the fruit of the Spirit has grown in my life experience by experience by experience, and I suspect it has happened in your life that way as well. So let me just share a couple of those. Um, love, love. So love has grown in my life uh, largely in the laboratory of marriage and family, and so um, uh, loving Shirley and loving my kids and loving our, our parents and our brothers and sisters and, and being loved by them is a place that has allowed love to grow in my life and where God has stimulated love for others in my life. And then the, the love for the family of God and the family of the church is right behind that marriage and family piece where, where love grows. And so experience by experience by experience in marriage and family, in the church family, God teaches us and grows in us his love. Joy. I have found joy grow in my life often in, in the cauldron of grief, in the cauldron of crisis or storm. Um, back in 1999 and 2000, between Thanksgiving week of 1999 and the last week of January in 2000, both my best friend in ministry and my father died. Mike, my best friend, died the week just the Sunday before Thanksgiving, and the last week of, of January, January 28th, my dad died. And so in three months, I had grief upon grief two of the most important people in my life. And waves of sadness came over me. And, and the, it felt like in many ways in the next several weeks and, and even uh, several months that I was kind of going through the motions and, and, and 
everything was tainted by this sadness. And yet what I found was, as I turned to God, as I turned to the Holy Spirit, he kept showing me joy underneath, joy deeper than that sadness. I, I would preach and feel like I'm almost just going through the motions because of the grief and the sadness I felt. And yet those would be the messages where the Holy Spirit would do something in somebody's life and, and they would share with me what God had done and, and a great source of joy would come. And so he showed me, he taught me a deeper joy than the sadness and grief I was experiencing. Peace. Um, I've continued to have peace in the midst of the storm of the Methodist mess that we're going through. The uh, possibility of a division in this denomination. I've given my whole adult life as a pastor in the United Methodist Church. And uh, God has, has blessed that abundantly. And it grieves me in my heart to see uh, the, the fighting that's been going on and, and the need for this separation so we can stop fighting each other and get on about kingdom business. But here's what I've come to. God's got this. God's doing a new thing. On the other side of this, God's going to set us free to pursue him and to pursue winning the world to Christ in unity Maybe in a smaller denomination than the one we're in now, but the size of the denomination has come not to matter a bit, at least to me. The unity of the denomination means more. And so uh, I have peace. God's got this. God's doing a great thing. There's going to be a great pouring of his Holy Spirit out upon his church when this mess is all over and we are free to pursue him with all our hearts. Next is patience or forbearance. And I'll just say one line here. How do you spell teenagers? We raised teenagers. Enough said about the need for patience and how God teaches that to us. All right, I'm not going to go through all the fruit of the Spirit, but you, you get the idea that you get the, you get the principle that God grows the fruit of the Spirit into us experience by experience over years, over the time of our lives, after we give our lives to Jesus and as he grows us to be more and more like his son. And here's the bottom line. The bottom line of what I believe Paul is teaching us in Galatians chapter five is this. True freedom comes by surrender to his lordship, the lordship of Jesus Christ, his son. True freedom comes by surrender to his lordship. As long as we resist him, as long as we seek to go after our own way and our own stuff, we'll be disappointed. But when we surrender to his lordship, we'll be abundantly blessed. Sorry, I don't know why that is static today. Every once in a while, it just does this. All right. We're going we're gonna to persist on. Surrender. Turning to Jesus with all our heart. Giving him everything. That's the way to freedom. So I have to ask the question, does Jesus have all of you? Does he have everything? Have you given your life to him fully? Give your life to Jesus, and you will receive more and more and more of his power, his blessing, his transformation, his peace, more than you can imagine. I'd like to lead us in a prayer of surrender, and I wonder if you would pray with me. Father, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I want to hold back nothing today. God, would you open my mind and heart to understand places in me that I've kept closed off from Jesus, places in me where uh, Jesus has um, been in there and, and part of my life but has not ruled my life as Lord. I've insisted on my own way. That work of the flesh, Lord, I want to turn it over to you and I want you to root it out of my life, rid me of it, so that I can embrace fully the work of your Holy Spirit to transform. So come, Holy Spirit. Come take my life. I am yours. Jesus, I am yours. Make me what you want me to be. 
grow in me the fruit of the Spirit and let it totally replace the works of the flesh in my life so that I can be like Jesus. I ask it in your name, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One final point. The truth is that we can pray surrender to Jesus and still have storms in our lives, like this pandemic. So what about the storms? Well, a few weeks ago, you'll remember, we looked at the passage where Jesus was asleep in the boat and the boat was on the Sea of Galilee and the disciples, there was a raging storm. The boat was swamped. The disciples were afraid it was gonna sink and they were all gonna die. Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat and they had to go wake him up. As soon as they woke him up, he calmed the storm. So this is what I say about storms. Remember who's in the boat with you. Never forget who's in the back of the boat. And it may, it may seem like he's sleeping, but don't forget, if Jesus is in the boat with you, you will not be destroyed. You have nothing to fear. True freedom comes from surrender to him as King of kings and Lord of lords. We close with a simple chorus. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead, and he is Lord. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And now, dear ones, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all.